Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. I know it's soon. I tell her sweetly, my stock answer from before. But when it feels right, it feels right. It's like you don't even know, she says, as if to herself. Know what? That is Padre McCarthy. He's been one of the most unattainable bachelors in the whole country, maybe even the entire rugby world. You're not even Irish. I don't see what that has to do with anything, I say stiffly. I raise my chin defiantly but then realize I have a bit of baked bean sauce on my face. Shit. I wipe it off deftly and keep my composure. I guess I was right in how she felt about me. I'm not wanted. Not worthy. I have baked beans on my face. But I keep her gaze with mine as she says, I'm just saying, he's had a whole big life before you showed up. So? I ask pointedly, refusing to let her bait me. You didn't even know about his sister. Maybe you should learn a wee bit more about him before you take this step. I mean, taking his mam's engagement ring. That's serious. She's right about that and I hate it. She glances at the grandfather clock in the corner. Well, I better get the kitchen cleaned up. Nice talking to ye. I don't suppose I'll be invited to the wedding since I'm an ex-girlfriend and all. And after that bomb explodes all over me, she gets up and goes back into the kitchen. Whoa. We have a live one here. The conversation makes me lose my appetite. I abandon my plate, not wanting to bring it into the kitchen lest she try to bite me, and get on my boots and my coat and head outside. The cold, fresh air hits me in the face, and I close my eyes and breathe in until it hurts. Already it feels so much better being out here with the endless lawn in front of me, sparkling with thick frost. I make my way around to the back of the house, to the walled garden where I see Agnes with her back to me, bundled up like she's in the Arctic, hanging her laundry out to dry. Don't say top of the morning to YA, don't say top of the morning to YA. Top of the morning to YA, I say. She jumps, surprised to see me. Oof. You made me heart go crossways. Then she narrows her eyes at me. You know we don't say that here. Better to say, good morning or nothing at all. She turns her back to me, reaching for another peg. Well, I definitely won't be saying that again. Sheesh. Do you need any help? She cranes her neck to look at me. With me washing? No, dear. I like doing the washing. The weather has been fierce the last few days. Better to take the opportunity to be outside. She gestures to the falconry muse. Padraig's over there with McGavin. Who the hell is McGavin? I tell her thanks and head on over to find out for myself. With the white frost covering the garden walls, shrubs, and bare branches, and lumped in shimmering piles on top of dead flowers, 
It's magically beautiful but I can imagine how stunning it would be in the summer. There's a pinch in my heart at that thought, knowing I won't be here in the summer. But who knows, I might not even be here next week. The birds are kept in the muse, and I only saw them in passing yesterday. Up close, it's a row of four giant wood cages with metal bars to see out of, each about 200 square feet. Beside them is a shed, and in front of each cage is a post. Padraig is wearing a wool coat and standing among the empty posts with a big leather glove on his hand, and on top of his hand is a damn horned owl. My fake fiancé looks like he's just wandered off the moors, about to give Heathcliff a run for his money. Wow, I say quietly, stopping where I am so I don't get too close. Padre grins at me, that rare dimple appearing. Valerie meet Hooter McGavin. The owl swivels its head to look at me and I'm met with intelligent yellow eyes. Hooter McGavin. I repeat. Padraig shrugs lightly and admires the bird. His real name is McGavin. But when I was growing up, I loved that bloody Adam Sandler movie so much. Happy Gilmore? That's the one. It reminded me of when my dad briefly made me try golf once. Anyway, there was a character in it. Shooter McGavin, I say. I know. Right. So you know. And he's an owl, so. I laugh. I take it your dad doesn't accept the name. Oh no, he gets fully pissed off if I call him Hooter, but hey. He gestures with his head. Come on over. Get close. He doesn't bite. As gentle as a mouse, unless you're a mouse. I do love birds but seeing this one up close is something else. As I tepidly come forward, I can't take my eyes off of the furry, thick claws that are digging into Padraig's glove. So, birds of prey, huh? I say. Up close, the owl's grey feathers are intricately patterned. Beautiful kind of a strange hobby. It's not uncommon here. A lot of people use them for sport, for hunting. My dad used to, anyway. You know he played rugby but got injured. He was in a bad place after that. My mam suggested he take up falconry since he loved birds so much. It was the best thing for him, really. He pauses. Didn't make him any less of an ass, but it kept him busy. I took part in it from time to time, trying to please him but. He trails off and shrugs. Well, it looks like you know what you're doing, I tell him. He's so confident and comfortable with that owl on his arm. The owl looks as cool as a cucumber, albeit a little sleepy. I'm good at faking it, he says with a wink. Anyway, I can only handle all hooter here. The other, he nods his head at the cages, he doesn't accept me as much. He's a red-tailed hawk, named Clyde. Guess he's a lot like my dad in that way. He frowns, a wash of agitation coming across his brow. We used to have a kestrel and a barn owl too, but I suppose they got rid of them. I have to wonder what's going to happen now. 
Back in the day, when the birds were part of the draw of staying here, both my dad and Nan would take care of them, but with the way things are going. If you wanted to show me the ropes, maybe I could help out, I tell him. He eyes me, amused. You do know this isn't something you can pick up right away. It takes a lot of training and reading. I have nothing to do but train and read. I'm jobless, remember? Maybe I can write about it, I add, even though writing has been the last thing on my mind since coming here. I had all these grand plans to write articles and freelance and, you know, be responsible, and it's like the minute I met Padraig, all of that went out the window. He makes me brain dead. Well, if you're that keen on it, I'll see if I can get the books from Dad. Maybe if he's feeling up to it, he can teach ye, too. Will do a better job than me, so long as you don't mind being called an Egypt every now and then. I smile. I don't mind if he doesn't mind. I rub my lips together for a moment. Look, I didn't get a chance to talk to you last night about how long I'm staying and I'm really sorry I just blurted it out like that without discussing it with you first. It's fine, he says as the owl shifts slightly on his glove, his eyes starting to droop. I'm glad you said it. Really? That didn't freak you out? Okay, it freaked me out for a moment, but the truth is. I want ye here, Val. I don't think I can do this alone. Be here. See him like this, Anne. And what? He shakes his head. Nothing. But honestly, as long as you want to stay, I'm happy to have ye. And whenever you want to go, I'll pay your flight home. And if ye need money while you're here, I'll cover ye. And if you're too proud for me to cover ye, then this place always needs a helping hand. Okay, I say, hope rising in my chest. It's in this moment that I realize I have nothing going for me back at home. Nothing at all. And yet I already seem to have everything. Right in front of me. Holding an owl. Is it weird that I find this both terrifying and sexy? I ask him, quietly gesturing to Hooter McGavin. His grin widens. That's something I haven't heard before. Where were you when I was a teenager and hanging out with birds all day? My eyes dart over to the high hedge that runs between this property and the house next door where Gail lives. Didn't you say you got into trouble with the neighbor's daughter when you were a teenager? Was that Gail? How did you know it was Gail? I fold my arms. She told me just now over breakfast that she's an ex-girlfriend and doesn't expect to be invited to our wedding. She also told me I don't know you well enough and that we're moving too fast. He doesn't look impressed. She said all that just now? I don't think she likes me much. He sighs and looks off toward the house, the breeze catching the tips of his dark hair. It's not you. She doesn't like me. She seems to think you're a big deal. He rolls his eyes. Right. For the wrong reasons. Anyway, we were messy teenagers and there was a lot of heartache, and I was an ass on many accounts. 
It was a long time ago but perhaps she carries a grudge. I don't know. But she's nothing for ye to be worried about. She's no threat to our fake relationship. No, he says. He clears his throat and looks me over carefully. I was going to ask if you wanted to learn a few things about falconry, but perhaps we should head inside. It's just about freezing. I shake my head. I'm fine. It's so fresh out, it's making my hangover go away. Turns out I can't handle whiskey. First of all, that's blasphemy. And second of all, I thought you handled your whiskey just fine, he says. Falling asleep peacefully is what every Irish person should do but it's usually the opposite. He sticks his arm out and the owl opens his eyes. Now, here, the glove that I have is called the gauntlet. Obviously you need this or hooters we claws are going to break your skin. Those claws definitely aren't we. He reaches back to thin leather strips that hang off the owl's ankles and slips them between his fingers. These are the jesses. Normally they would tie onto a strip attached to the gauntlet like a leash, but Hooter ain't going anywhere, so I just hold the jesses lightly. Otherwise it attaches to the perch over here. He starts walking toward the post, the top of it lined with artificial grass. I start following him, keeping my distance, when Padraig suddenly stops and throws his other arm out to the side, stiff as a board. What? I ask. He shakes his head, keeps walking, but then his frame starts to lurch to the side his legs crossing, and then his going down. His glove opens, and just before he slams into the frozen grass, the owl flaps his giant wings and takes flight. I don't have time to worry about the owl. Padraig. I yell, rushing over to him and dropping to my knees, hand at his back. My God! Are you okay? What happened? He's on the ground like an injured beast, but is not getting up. His eyes are shut tight and he's trying to breathe. McGavin. The owl. The owl, he says, voice hoarse. I can't lose him. I can't lose him. I look around, trying to see the owl in the nearby trees, but I can't. I don't know where he went. What happened? Are you okay? I'm not okay. I can't lose that owl. I can't, I can't, he keeps muttering to himself. My dad will kill me, he'll bloody kill me. Shit. He's more upset about the owl than the fact that he lost his balance for no reason and fell over like a damn tree. I'll help you get him back, I tell him, stroking the back of his head. Just as long as you tell me you're okay. Do I need to yell for help? No, he says, whimpering. No, I'm fine. The owl. I can't. I can't lose him. It can't happen again, not again. Jesus. To see this big tank of a man down like this, it's unnerving. I want nothing more than to help him, to protect him. Okay, it's okay. I tell him soothingly. I try and grab his arm. 
Come on, you need to at least sit up. I pull at him but he's almost dead weight. Finally he moves and sits up, leaning against the pole. I crouch in front of him, my hands on his face. His skin is cold to the touch, like the air. Padraig, I say gently, brushing his hair off his forehead. Look at me. He looks up at me with red eyes, drained eyes. The kind of eyes that have just been through something traumatizing and can barely manage to keep being traumatized. I place my hand at his cheek. I'm going to try and get your bird back. Give me your glove, your gauntlet, whatever. I reach down and pull the leather glove off. Now, is there something I need to do, like a call or something? Should I hoot like an owl? You know, it's one of my many talents. Hoo hoo, hoo hoo. Okay. So I'm trying to make him laugh and it's not working. The man looks fucking lost. I'll be back, I tell him. Don't go anywhere. I slip on the giant glove, feeling a bit like Thanos but without any of the power. It engulfs my hand and forearm but is blissfully warm from Padraig, then I start walking out across the field to the trees. I scan the branches, wondering if he's flown farther than that. I thought most falconry birds always returned, so I would think he's close by. But I can't see him anywhere. I'm starting to panic because I know Padraig is on the ground back there and he's panicking. There's something seriously wrong with him. The thought grips me and I don't want to think about it but it might be true. Maybe it is just the stress of everything and maybe these are just panic attacks, but panic attacks that are strong enough to bring a brick house of a man down like that means serious trouble. I don't want him to sweep it under the rug. I go over how I'm going to broach the subject with him when a flash of white and grey catches my eyes. There. The owl flies forward from the depths of the forest and lands on a nearby branch. He's surveying the land, probably looking for prey. Probably hungry. I suddenly turn around and run back to Padraig who is still sitting on the ground, his head in his hands. Hey, I found him. I need to law him. Don't you law him with treats? Where is his food? He doesn't answer and I try not to let that break my heart, so I look around and spot a leather pouch lying by the open door to the owl's cage. I fumble through the pouch until I find something that I hope is a piece of chicken. I run back out to the field, the owl still on the branch. I think he's looking at me, but who knows. I stick out my arm and put the piece of chicken on the back of my hand. My arm starts to shake but I keep it out there. The owl spots me. Starts to fly. Oh shit. He really is going to land on me. I'm no weakling and my arms are the opposite of twigs, but that's a big fucking bird with a big fucking beak and big fucking claws, and it's going to land on my arm and snap it in two. At the last minute, I prop my arm up with my other arm and try not to scream. The owl lands on me and immediately starts pecking at the chicken. I sway from the impact but otherwise my arm is holding steady, even without support. 
I'm kind of an idiot, forgetting that birds have hollow bones and not weighing a lot kind of enables them to, you know, fly. Still, the rest of me is shaking, and I'm panicking, especially as the owl is staring right at me, right into my soul. I fumble for the leather strips that hang off his legs and grasp them in my fingers. Then I very carefully, very slowly, very awkwardly, walk back over to Padraig and the Muse, which, by the way, sounds like a great band name. I put the owl back in his cage, where he flies to his perch, then I quickly shut the door and exhale the breath I most definitely had been holding that whole time. I sit down on the ground beside Padraig, ignoring the bite of the frozen grass against my leggings. Hey, I say to him softly. It's okay. I did it. I reach over and take his hand away from his face and hold it in mine, squeezing it hard. It's okay. The owl, your Hooter McGavin, is back in his bird box. He's fine. He's safe. You're safe too, but you're not fine, are you? He takes in a deep breath and opens his eyes looking at me with clarity that wasn't there before. And maybe a touch of embarrassment. I'm sorry, he whispers. I'm so sorry. For what? For acting the maggot. Tell me that's another saying. I lost my shite. I shouldn't have. I don't know what happened. You fell is what happened. I know. I just lost my balance. I think the ground must be uneven here, he says, I scanning the ground as if that could be it when we both know it's not. You were pretty upset about losing the owl, I say carefully. Like, Nervous breakdown kind of upset. He nods, licking his lips. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Do you want to tell me about it? He studies me for a moment, as if he's trying to deduce whether he can trust me or not. I would hope at this point that he could but the truth is I guess we don't really owe each other that in real life, just in our fake one. After my mam and sister died, he says quietly, clearing his throat, my dad and I grew apart. I think we were enemies. My nan, back then, she was living elsewhere and she had to come move in with us just to keep the peace. He was drinking all the time. Cruel. He'd tell me things, things like it was my fault somehow that they died. Or that he'd rather have a daughter than a son. Things like that. Things that, when you're 16, you take to heart. Or at any age, I say. Maybe. So we had another horned owl like McGavin. His name was Jasper. And my dad, he put all his love and energy into that bird and none into me, and I needed him the most, you know. Not the bird. I needed him. I'd lost my mother and I needed him and I never had his love anymore. And so, one night I came out here and opened the cage, and I let the owl loose. Owls are nocturnal, I knew he'd never come back. He, he takes in a deep breath, and guilt and shame radiates from him. The next morning my dad went out there to feed him and he saw the bird was gone. 
Obviously someone had let Jasper out. I admitted it before he had a chance to blame me. I told him I was glad that the stupid bird was gone, that now he can be like me with nothing left to love. It was ugly. It still scars me to this day. And I know that the rift between us started when they died, but it became a fucking fracture the day I let that owl go. We've never been the same. Jeez. This is heavy. No wonder their relationship is so rife with tension. Last night it was like everyone was walking on eggshells around them. Except for me, who was just blundering about, not really having an idea about that, nor about what happened to his mother or that he had a sister. I'm really sorry, I say softly, staring deep into his dark eyes that are sheltering so much turmoil. It makes sense now why you need to be here and make amends while you can. It's more complicated than that. Oh, I know it is. Hello, I'm your fake fiancé. A hint of a smile ghosts on his lips. You really have been amazing, you know that? I shrug. I'm glad you think that because I feel like I've been doing nothing but fucking up. No, he says, shifting to face me dead on. He cups my face in his hands and searches my eyes feverishly. No, you are amazing. You are wonderful. You went and you got that bird back. I can't believe you did that. But you didn't hesitate. You just put on the gauntlet and did it. Do you know how incredible that is? How incredible you are. My cheeks go warm, but maybe it's his strong palms pressed against my face. I did what I had to do. I couldn't stand to see you like that. And that was the last thing I wanted you to see. But I'm still here. If you recall from last night, I'm not going anywhere for a long time. He leans in and kisses me on the mouth, then the corner of my lips, then my nose, then my forehead. You are fierce. Valerie Stevens. A wild bird that could fly away but chooses to stay with me, and I am forever grateful for that. Believe me, I am. Okay. I might be melting just a little inside. Or maybe a lot. No one has ever said anything like that to me before. No one has ever looked at me that way before. I might just turn into a puddle right here, one that won't freeze over. He brings my hand to his mouth and kisses my knuckles, and I melt some more. Come on, he says. Let's go back inside and get warm. Valerie. After the incident at the Muse, the rest of the day goes by at a calm, slow, and steady pace. Padraig managed to get a bunch of books on falconry for me, since it appears I have a natural talent, the Owl Whisperer, if you will, and I spent a good chunk of the day reading by the fire. Padraig, meanwhile, spent most of his day sleeping, kind of the reverse of yesterday. I didn't question it after this morning. After all, it was fairly traumatic, and he is under a lot of stress. I also think it could be related to his concussion. Or maybe he just wants some damn time alone. Either way, it didn't bother me, 
and when he came out for dinner, things went a lot smoother than they did the night before. His father was still grumpy but quiet, though he ate more than he did the night before. Nan talked about the weather and Major talked about some woman he was dating, which was beyond cute. I sat beside Padraig and he kept his hand on my leg the whole time. It felt good to have his comfort, even if it wasn't quite real. But what is real? The words that he told me this morning had to be real. They were only for me, and not for show. But when he kisses me in front of everyone, is that real? Or is that for show? And if it's not for show, how come that doesn't happen enough in private? This is getting very confusing, and I keep playing along because it's what I agreed to and I want to be with him. Even if it's just fake, I want to be around him and I want to pretend. The problem is, over time, it won't be pretending anymore. When I look at him, he makes me feel all my emotions physically. My chest burns with frustration. My stomach skips with yearning. My skin alights with desire. My bones feel as light and hollow as a bird's, that feeling you get when you look at someone and you might just float away from the pure fizzy joy that's filling you like air. I'm barely tethered to anything. I need to be tethered. I need to keep my heart intact. We're barely into this facade and if I'm feeling this way already, what's going to happen in a week and after that? Deep down, I know I'm heading for a heartache so severe it might just destroy me once and for all. And yet, despite the fear, I'm not going to push it away. Because how lucky would I be to fall in love with this man? I don't think many people truly get to do that, even if it's all a lie in the end. What are you doing tonight? Padraig asks me after we carry our dishes to the kitchen. Gail told us to leave them but I think we're doing this to bug her. Tonight? I ask. Oh, you know. Sleeping. How about we head down to my mate Alistair's pub? The Velvet Bone. I need to start jotting down all these wicked Irish pub names. So is that a yes? I laugh and punch him on the arm. Of course that's a yes. And that's when I notice Gail staring at us, so I quickly kiss him on the cheek, grab his hand, and lead him out of the kitchen. I don't want to drive if I'm drinking, he says to me once we're out of earshot but it's just down the road. Do you think you can handle the walk? I'm actually touched that he's that thoughtful. How long of a walk? The truth is, I can't be on my feet for more than a few hours at a time. For some reason, when I was younger, I could do Disney World no problem but now I can't do more than half a day. My back pain gets unreal. About 20 minutes. Oh, that's no problem at all. But we're going to have to bundle up because I bet it's freezing out there. I'm right, too, though it could just be cold compared to the contrast of the warm fire. It's a beautiful night though. The crisp sky so clear that I can see every single star. Look at that, I say as we walk down the driveway, heads craned back to stare at the dark night sky.
Doesn't that make you feel so small? He muses over that for a moment and then says, Nah. Nah. He looks amused to disagree with me. It makes me feel like, with all that space and all those infinite universes, this is the only one that counts. People say that it puts all your problems into perspective, but it just makes my own problems seem bigger, since I'm the only me in this whole universe. And there's only one me to handle these problems. You know what I mean like? I guess, I say. But it still makes me feel small. Like look at this. We've reached the main road and I gesture out across the landscape. At night, the rolling green hills become as black and fathomless as the skies above, and the occasional light from a house could be another star. It all bleeds together, all becomes one. Doesn't it make you think we're sitting on the edge of the universe? Doesn't that make you seem insignificant? Look, if you want me to wax poetic about how you're more significant than every star in the sky, I can do that. Believe me, my mother was quite the poet, but I can always try and see what I come up with. Roses are red, violets are blue, now let's get to the pub before it closes on us, he says with a smile and gives me a wink. The velvet bone is located along a country lane with a small smattering of houses about. Upstairs there's a few hotel rooms, but downstairs is where the party is. Or, in this case, it happens to be about six locals, sitting around and drinking beer and watching darts on the television. When we walk in, we get the royal entrance. For feck's sake, the bartender yells at us once we step inside, clapping his hands. Look what the bloody cat dragged in. Padraig McCarthy. And this must be your M.O.T. His M.O.T.? It means girlfriend, Padraig explains. And actually, she's my fiancé. And as has happened every time Padraig says that word, the room goes quiet. I'm starting to think that people must have placed bets on whether he would ever settle down with someone or not. I'm lucky, I think. No, you're just acting, I quickly remind myself. You're kidding, the bartender says, then glares at him suspiciously. Don't tell me this is your ploy to get a round bought for ye, because we all know how much money your ass makes, it's printed in the bloody papers. Not kidding. Alistair, this is Valerie. Valerie, this is Alistair. He's okay most of the time. The rest of the time is a real tosser. Hey, he yells at him. I laugh. Nice to meet you. Oh my God. And she's an American, Alistair says, looking at everyone else in the bar. He's really branching out. Well, fuck. He leaps over the bar surprisingly spry. Come give me a bloody hug, you Egypt. Alistair pulls Padraig into a hug. You too, he says to me, scooping me up. I laugh. He's on the short side and built like a gymnast, but even so he has no trouble getting me off the ground. He slaps me on the back. He's a cute guy, pale, with brown hair and light eyes. Very mischievous looking. 
I can tell he's going to be trouble. So, when the fuck did all this nonsense happen, huh? Sit down and tell us the story. We take our seats at the bar, and before we can order anything, Alistair has poured us each a pint of Guinness. He raises the one he was already drinking and says, Cheers. We all raise our glasses. The whole pub does. Cheers to the happy couple and for Padraig ending his chronic bachelorism. Cheers, everyone says. I take a sip of my beer and watch as everyone else sucks half of it down in one go. The taste of Guinness hasn't grown on me yet. So, first of all mate, Alistair says to Padraig, leaning against the bar on his elbows. Where on earth did you find her? She's far too good for the likes of ye. At a pub, of course, Padraig says, palming his beer. God, he has such good hands. Just staring at them now, away from the eyes of his family, surrounded by dim lights and dark wood and the smell of beer, it feels like my hormones are being ramped up with each passing second. It's funny how, even though I can get away with lusting after him when we're at the B&B, I prefer to do it in private. Because in private, it's real. Otherwise it feels like it's just for show, even if it isn't. Either way, I don't feel anyone in this dark pub needs a show, so I ogle him as he tells his friend about how we met combining both the real and the fake. He looks even sexier and somehow more enigmatic now than he did when I first laid eyes on him. His black hair is a bit spiky at the top, and I think he must have run some styling paste through it before we left. His beard is very neatly trimmed, and he's wearing one of his many Henleys, this one a moss green that seems to bring out lighter dimensions in his dark brown eyes and fits him like an absolute glove, showing off his boulders for shoulders and his thick, commanding forearms. I admire those forearms the way I admired his hands, knowing the skill they have and what they can do. Not just to my body, but out there on the rugby pitch. Fuck. I would love nothing more than to see him in action. Then he's got charcoal jeans that make his round, muscular ass look amazing, his boots, his black wool peacoat crammed under the stool in a pile. I have no doubt that the coat is some kind of designer and it boggles my mind to have that much money to do that with your clothes and not care. Or maybe it's just that he's a guy. Aside from his place, which, though small, must have cost a ton, his car, and his clothes, Padraig doesn't at all give off any sense that he's aware of his money. He's not showy with it, though I'm sure he could have a lavish lifestyle if he wanted to. I have a feeling that might be an Irish thing, to stay humble and keep your wealth hidden. Or perhaps it's his upbringing. I think back to what we talked about earlier at the Muse. How hard it must have been for him. His mother gone. A baby sister who only got to see the world for five days. So much loss, and so fast and so soon. I was lucky that my accident happened when I was so young, since I was able to adapt and live the rest of my life with this new reality. But to lose so much at 16, I don't know how he's done it. Then to lose the relationship with his father. I can see why all of this matters so much to Padraig, 
even if he's shouldering so much of it deep inside. I want to help him carry that load. Maybe that's inappropriate of me, but it's the truth. I want his trust and I want him, into all his darkness that he hides from the world. And so what do you do, Valerie? I blink and look up from my beard to see Alistair staring at me expectantly. What do I do? For work and such. Though perhaps you're a kept woman. I wouldn't be surprised. I'd do the same if I had the luck to be with Padraig. He's so dreamy, ain't he? He reaches across and pinches Padraig's cheek. Oh, sod off, Padraig says grumpily, batting his hand away. Ah, well, I'm a writer, I tell him. Oi, a writer? My God, no wonder you found Padraig. There isn't any money in writing, he says. I hate to well actually him but. Well, actually, until recently I was a full-time writer for an online newspaper. Online? And they paid ye? Very well, I lie. So it wasn't great pay but there were benefits, and that was good enough. And then what happened? I was hoping he wouldn't ask. Ah, uh, I'm just writing freelance now. He winces. OOF, that's got to be hard. Well, actually, Padraig says, and I can't help but smile at that. Valerie is extremely talented, so it comes easy to her. Right now. She's writing an article about falconry. You McCarthy's and your crazy birds, Alistair says with a shake of his head as he pours himself and Padraig another pint. You should write about rugby. You'll get way more hits. Hey, or ye can make a sex tape. Those always go over well when there's a rugby player involved. Sell that and bingo. Speaking of money, Padraig says, changing the subject since I'm already blushing at the mention of a sex tape. How's the business going here? Oh, just brilliant. Padraig looks at me. We've always been rivals, ye see. Up this way out of town. There's just his hotel and our B and B. He may have the birds, but I have the booze. He takes a sip of his beer and grins. That said, it is January and if we don't get any guests soon I'll be pulling a tenner out of a leper's ass with me teeth. I burst out laughing. That's one way of putting it. We have many ways of putting things, sweetheart, Alistair says with a shrug. He raises what's left of his beer. Here's to a better tomorrow, then. We raise our glasses, clinking them against each other. And we drink. And we drink. And we drink. Before I know it, I've actually finished three pints and I'm about to explode. I head over to the ladies' room, which they call the Jacks, and when I come back, Alistair is going around the room, dimming the lights and pulling all the curtains shut and locking the door. What's happening? I ask, sounding slightly panicked my mind immediately thinking we're back in the States and in some kind of lockdown situation. It's called a lock-in, Padraig explains. 
The pubs here have to close by 11.30 so this is one way of getting around that. We make it look like no one is home and the party continues. Ain't that right, boys, he asks the other three men who have remained. They do a drunken cheer in response. Yeah. S-H-H-H-H. In other words, Padraig says as I take my seat beside him. You're one of us now. One of us, one of us, the men start chanting, slamming their fists on the table. S-H-H-H-H. Alistair hushes them again. One of us, one of us, they say more quietly. I beam at them, not so secretly thrilled. Even though it's silly to think you belong because you're locked in an Irish pub, it hits right through to the heart of me. I've never belonged to anything before. My whole life, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I was bullied and ridiculed for just being a little bit different. I was too eager and afraid for friends. My family never made me feel like I belonged with them either. Angie was the smart one, and Sandra was the pretty and outgoing one, and I just. I was the one who was crippled and flawed and weird and withdrawn, and so many things, things that I know my mother never hoped for when I was born. And later in life. I did what I could to make friendships, but I wanted, I needed, them to be something more than shallow, and yet I had such a hard time converting that. I had a hard time opening up. I just wanted to look as perfect as I could on the outside to hide how imperfect I was on the inside. But here, here in this pub, here with Padraig, I don't feel I have to hide. Which is ironic, considering I'm supposed to be living out a lie and half the things coming out of my mouth aren't true. They said I was one of them. For now, I'm just going to believe it. I put my hand on Padraig's knee and give it a light squeeze as I lean in, breathing in his woodsy scent, feeling the heat of his neck. I whisper in his ear. Thank you for making me feel like I belong. Here, with your family, with everything. He turns his face to mine, eyes brimming with intensity as he looks deeply at me, and captures my mouth in a soft, warm kiss, as sweet and tender as anything. Oi, get a room, Alistair says, coming around the bar and start by renting one upstairs. He wags his brows. I giggle, feeling the alcohol swarm through my veins, and I bury my face in Padraig's neck, wanting more than anything for us to be alone. That one night stand wasn't enough, and even though sober me has been glad for the separate bedrooms, Drunk me just wants to get laid like the horn dog I am around this man. Soon, I'm woozy and horny and it's time to go. I keep pawing away at Padraig like a dog in heat. We say our goodbyes and go out the back door so the rest of the pub can stay locked in, and the moment we're outside into the sharp air and around the dark corner, Padraig is pushing me back against the stone wall of the pub and devouring me. His hands go under my coat, my hands go into his hair, and our kisses are messy and wild, like we might just eat each other alive. I'm moaning his name and his grunting in response, these hoarse sounds that make me so wet I know my underwear is soaked through. But as much as I am deliriously hungry for him, as much as I've tried to ignore how riled up I've been ever since yesterday, 
when he lay on top of me on the bed and I felt how damn hard he was, I want to get him off. I want his gorgeous eyes to roll back in his head, and I want his hands in my hair and I want him grunting out my name as he comes. I reach down for his fly and quickly unzip it, bringing his cock out. Valerie, he murmurs against my lips, and I smile in response before dropping down to my knees. I know it's cold out, though you would never know it with his dick, and I quickly draw him into my mouth where he immediately moans. God, yes. Fucking suck me off, he bites through a groan and puts his hands into my hair, making fists and guiding his cock into my mouth. I take him eagerly, my tongue licking down his hard ridge, swirling around the thickness of his head, tasting the salt of him. He tastes good, fresh and sharp, like a man, and I go at him harder, deeper, until he's nearly thrusting into the back of my throat. Oh, I don't have long, darling, he says hoarsely, tugging on my hair harder now, almost to the point of pain. I pull back just enough to run the tip of him over my lips as if I'm applying lipstick. I want you to come. I want to swallow you.